Have you ever read an article or seen an analyst on TV talk about a stock and give a recommendation you know that is just wrong? Are these analysts wrong, stupid, or are they lying? We'll look into these problems. Also, we're going to once again look at the grand unification theory of the stock market. And lastly, we'll look at TLT, which I purchased this morning. So let's go. This is an article that came out a few years ago, and it's about a stock analyst right before the dot-com bust. So the article is a little old, and of course the story is old, but it's emblematic of the situation today. So I'm going to read this article to you, and I'm not sure how this is going to show up in the video because this is prior to editing, so I'll just do the best that I can here. But the article is Why Wall Street Lies and How You Can Defend Yourself. And I'm just going to read to you here, so bear with me. The job of a financial analyst is simple. They write reports and issue an investment recommendation to either buy, sell, or hold a stock. To me, that sounds like an exciting job that would pay an honest wage. Unfortunately, a guy by the name of Henry Blodgett was exposed for all that is not so exciting and dishonest about this trade. And for information purposes, Henry Blodgett is still on Wall Street, but he's not an analyst any longer. He's a market commentator. Blodgett rose to fame during the dot-com years when he predicted the share price of Amazon, a new internet retailer, would hit $400 a share. Well, wouldn't you like to have bought that uh, given today's price? His prediction rang true as the stock shot up 128% just one month later. The Amazon call received a lot of attention, and he soon left his job for generous offer from Merrill Lynch, quickly becoming the most followed internet expert in the world. With his huge salary at Merrill Lynch, he was obligated to recommend many internet companies as strong buys. These stock picks were making tons of money for his investors and for Merrill Lynch, and everyone was happy with the income of easy money. However, in private company emails, Blodgett was calling the same strong buys, crap, junk, and POSs. The situation was a massive conflict of interest that no one seemed to pay much attention to except Elliot Spitzer, the Attorney General and Governor of New York at that time. Now, Elliot himself got in trouble, as uh, you may know. But Blodgett was charged with civil securities fraud by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and eventually agreed to a ban from Wall Street and a $4 million fine. And if I'm correct, if my recollection is correct, I think that Merrill Lynch paid that $4 million. While Blodgett got caught for his false recommendations, analyst opinions continued to drive coverage of the stock market. Ordinary investors continually see new articles about companies they invest in. For example, again, this is old, after Apple last reported quarterly earnings, a Goldman Sachs analyst noted that guidance was far worse than feared and lowered his price target from $575 to $500 per share, maintaining a buy rating. A Piper Jaffray analyst thought Apple might trade higher in 2013, maintaining his price target of $688 per share and an overweight rating. Should we pay attention to the sold called financial experts? The simple answer is no. And I'm going to move down here to this paragraph. Here's the behind the scenes game that's being played. Institutional investors need to decide which firm they want to buy their stock research from. And they highly value if the firm and analysts have direct access to the management of the companies they cover. This means that analysts need to maintain good relations with management, which puts pressure on them to make positive remarks and recommendations, even when their own research doesn't support it. An analyst that loses access to management 
means that the firm loses revenue from institutional investors, and the analyst loses compensation while at the same time putting their careers in jeopardy. So, if ordinary investors can't trust Wall Street, what should they do with their money? Now, the article continues on, and I think you get the idea that essentially the same thing continues today. So, should you rely on these analysts? Again, the short answer is no. And here's my answer. My answer is relatively simple, and this is why I'm doing what I do and why I call myself Chew Dog Charts is because, and you perhaps have heard this slogan before, is that charts don't lie. And that's why I use charts as a fundamental basis in my valuation of a company and a stock. Charts don't lie. So let's go on to a chart. This is the 20-year monthly chart on the spiders. And in order to see whether an analyst is wrong or worse, I always go to the charts because it's very easy to see whether a stock is overvalued or undervalued. And I always start with the monthly chart. So here we are with the spiders. And just simply looking at the price chart, we can see that the current price is still above the 20 and the 50 EMAs. Moving down here into the oscillators, beginning with the MACD, we can see that the current level of the MACD is essentially higher than any other period of time going back 20 years. So simply by this oscillator and the other oscillators, you can tell that the probability is that reverting to the mean is going to happen sooner or later. And each of these oscillators, they all indicate that the current price of the chart is relatively high. Some of them are coming down here, such as the RSI. We're at a uh, 61.45, which is getting close to the mean. The stochastics are coming down too, the volume, but as well, the Williams is heading down and the Williams is now at the midline or the negative 50. But the price chart and the MACD are still elevated. So that's a real easy way to tell whether or not a stock is overvalued or undervalued and then you can use that as a benchmark with regard to what you're hearing from an analyst. I'll read analysts reports but for the most part I don't watch any more TV anymore. I've had enough of CNBC, MSNBC and Bloomberg so I don't pay attention to that anymore. All right and this chart here is also a great segue into the next item we're going to talk about, which is the grand unification theory of the stock market. We talked about this in the last video. Looking at the stock price here and going back to 2009, the so-called grand unification of theory of the stock market, in my opinion, is represented right through here. And what this is, is you can see a relatively uniform movement up. And this is uh, based in large part on algorithms. You have a whole bunch of algorithms that are being employed in the stock market, and they just continue to go up and up and up and up. And the thing about algorithms and the current Wall Streeters is that, if I'm correct, I believe that most of the people on Wall Street today have less than 10 years experience. And so that means that they have not experienced a bear market. And as you can see, we're not in a bear market or it's not defined yet, but we've had a lot of trouble since late January, early February. And I think the algorithms are having a lot of trouble. So once again, in my opinion, I would rather not rely on an algorithm. I'd rather rely on my own skills and analytical skills taking a look at a stock and I always like to take a look at a chart because again charts don't lie. So now let's go ahead and take a look at TLT. So hopefully you've seen my two videos with regard to the bond market and if you've seen those then you know my opinion is that the the bond market is hitting a turning point. 
The 10-year yield has approached that uh, long-term trend line, and in my opinion, it's going to reflect back down here soon enough simply because I think we're going to have an event. I don't necessarily know what that event is going to be, and it doesn't really matter to me. Whether it's another sell-off or a collapse or a crash or whatever it may be, it may just simply be a reflection and a repricing of the bond. But I think that that's coming up in not too long. So, as I said, I'm going to try to take advantage of that, and in doing so, I have bought uh, this morning the TLT. And a TLT is, uh, as you can see here, it's the iShares 20 plus year treasury bond ETF. And that's the way that I like to play the bond. I don't go out and actually buy some bonds and stick them into my safe deposit box or anything like that. I simply buy through the iShares, the 20-year treasury bond ETF, and the symbol is TLT. And essentially, it's the uh, the inverse of a bond. The uh, With a bond, when the yield goes up, the price goes down. And so as you can see here, this is a 20-year monthly chart on TLT. And we're at uh, 118.28 at this level here. So what I've wait, done is I've waited for this uh, retest of the bottom here, and we're retesting that now. I think we're going to be successful, and hence that's why I started buying. And let's go down here and take a look at the MACD. The MACD is uh, still uh, heading down in uh, somewhat of an acceleration, but I think it's going to be turning here real soon. Um, we'll take a look at the shorter term uh, chart on this uh, here in a moment, but I th think it's turning here simply because that this downtrend is not as strong as this downtrend here. Moving into the momentum, same thing. The downtrend there versus here is just not as far down. You can see that uh, as well as on the price rate of change. The relative strength is uh, pretty similar in how far down it went. The stochastics is probably going to be pretty similar too, and it may carry down here. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. And then here into the volume, volume is picking up a little bit. And the Williams, the Williams uh, heading down, but so far this level here is still above this level here. So to my mind, that's uh, some level of input. Going back up here, as you can see, again, I've waited here for the retest. And we're definitely below the 20 and the 50 EMAs. And I'm looking for a turn someplace here or within the next, uh, say, month or two at the most. Now, in my buys, I don't go all in. I just stage or stagger my purchases. So my purchase this morning is the first of probably several purchases that I'll do over a span of uh, certainly a few weeks or so. But let's go into the six-month chart on the TLT. So this is the six-month daily chart on TLT. And similar to the annual chart um, here in the monthly chart, this is the second test of the low that we hit here. And in the annual chart, in the yearly chart, the test was uh, earlier, say way back in 2017, and this is now the second test. So this whole period here on an annual basis is the second test. But on a daily basis, I'm again, this here is a second test of the six month daily chart. And moving down here, and I think I've told you before that I really like this sort of pattern here. And you can see this pattern here as well. You'll have the fast line attempting to move up and then get reflected back down. And that's the point in time that I like to purchase right here, right as it uh, potentially uh, turns up and through the trigger line. So I've made my purchase here perhaps a little bit earlier, but again, I told you that I'm going to be staggering my purchases, so I'm in no hurry. And we see here by the histogram, things are improving, as well as the momentum, a little bit of improvement here. The price rate of change, we got the move up and then a reflection back down. So in the next couple of weeks or so, I expect that this fast line is going to move up and through the slow line. 
here in the relative strength, we're at uh, 40.24, which is relatively weak, but uh, some improvement since, uh, say, back in April. Here, the stochastics, the fast line has moved up through, but uh, like here, I would imagine that the uh, fast line might be moving up and through a couple of times. I'm not too concerned about that. We're still down here, which is uh, similar to that level there. Volume, volume is moderate. It's not going to tell me much. Here, the Williams is some slight improvement there. So back on up here again. I am going to stagger my purchases, so this uh, perhaps could fall a little bit further, and that uh, is not going to be really much concern. I'm going to stagger my purchases in several blocks over the next couple of weeks or so. And uh, again, if you watched the two videos on the bond, you know what my feelings are, and I'll express some of those uh, in upcoming videos as well. So for today, that's Chew Dog Charts. Thank you.